In this video, what we are going to discuss is the 1991 revised rule on summary procedure. But please take note that ang pag-uusapan lang natin sa video na ito is yung summary procedure ng civil cases. Take note ha, civil cases muna, wala mo ng criminal cases. If you are going to read the bar exam coverage issued by the Supreme Court, ang sabi doon, when it comes to the rule on summary procedure, you study only the cases covered by the rule, the effect of failure to answer, the preliminary conference and appearance of parties, prohibited readings and motions, and last is appeal. But what are we going to do? We will study the rule on procedure in its entirety, but we will just give an emphasis on these five topics na pinili ng Supreme Court. Kailan nag-take effect ang revised rule on summary procedure? Answer can be found in Section 23. The, the rule took effect or it became effective on November 15, 1991. Let's go now to the purpose. If you will be asked about the purpose of the rule on summary procedure, I want you to remember two words. What are these words? Number one is expeditious and second is inexpensive. Saan natin nakuha si expeditious and expensive? Makikita nyo dyan sa pagbasa nyo pa lang ng rule on summary procedure na sa bungad. The purpose is to achieve an expeditious and expensive and an expensive determination of cases that is under summary procedure. And if you're going to relate that to your section 36 of the Batas Pambansa Bilang 129, you will see that again, to achieve an expeditious and an expensive determination without regard to technical rules. So please remember ha, two words, expeditious and inexpensive. Let's go to the applicability. Section 1 has the answer. This rule shall govern the summary procedure in the metropolitan trial courts, municipal trial courts in cities, municipal trial courts, and municipal circuit trial courts. So we go now to the procedure. So what is the procedure in civil case? Take note ha, nasa civil case lang muna tayo. Wala pa si criminal. Si criminal will come later. So what is the procedure? You begin with the filing of a complaint with the MTC. In, in that um, filing, there will be determination of the filing fees and then you have to pay your filing fees. After payment, the case now will be docketed by the clerk of court. But what is the requirement of the rule? The requirement is the pleading or that complaint must be verified. Section 3, letter B, very clear, all pleadings shall be verified. Next, the court will determine if your case falls under summary procedure. Basis, Section 2, upon the filing of a civil action, the court shall issue an order. What is that order all about? It is an order that will declare whether or not your case is under this rule on summary procedure. You take note of section 2 kasi very important yan. Marami kayong mababasa dyan sa judicial ethics na cases kung saan sinampahan si judge ng kaso ng mga parties. Ano ang sinamba kay judge? Gross ignorance of the law. Ano ang nakasulat sa section 2? If there would be an erroneous determination, a patently erroneous determination of the application of the rule on summary procedure that is a ground for disciplinary action. Question, how will the court determine if the case falls under summary procedure? Madali lang. All the court needs to do is read section 1. For civil cases, Ano ang nakasulat sa Section 1? Lahat ng kaso ng forcible entry and unlawful detainer pasok sa summary procedure. All cases of forcible entry and unlawful detainer, irrespective of the amount of damages, irrespective of the amount of unpaid rentals, sought to be recovered. And if there are attorney's fees that will be awarded, you have to make sure that the attorney's fees shall not exceed 20,000 pesos. What else? All other civil cases where the total amount of the claim of the plaintiff does not exceed 
200,000 in Metropolitan Manila or it does not exceed 100,000 outside of Metropolitan Manila, exclusive of interest and cost. Take note, ha? exclusive of interest and cost. Where did we get the amount of 100,000 and 200,000? That is your November 9, 2002 amendment issued by the Supreme Court. Very clear ang amount na naka-indicate. Take note, however, that the rule on summary procedure does not include probate proceedings. It does not include probate proceedings. So kahit yung amount is... Uh, does not even if the amount does not exceed 100,000 or 200,000 as long as it, it is a probate proceeding hindi pasok sa rule on summary procedure kailan pa hindi nag-a-apply si rule on summary procedure it does not apply to a civil case where the cause of action of the plaintiff is pleaded in the same complaint with another cause of action and that another cause of action is subject to the ordinary procedure. Bar question 1995, Albert, he forcibly entered and occupied the house and lot owned by his neighbor, Carissa. Carissa immediately sued Albert for the recovery of the property. Carissa also claimed damages amounting to 100,000 pesos, other undetermined losses as the result of the forcible entry, and attorney's fees in the amount of 25,000 pesos. Albert sets up affirmative defenses in his answer, but he did not question the title of Carissa over the property. So question, is the case triable under the summary procedure? Answer is, yes. Ba ano, bakit? Ano ulit ang sinabi natin? Lahat ng kaso ng forcible entry and unlawful detainer, they are subject to summary procedure irrespective of the amount of damages claimed. But how about the attorney's fees? When it comes to the attorney's fees, where attorney's fees are awarded, the same shall not exceed... 20,000 pesos. What is the next step after the court determines that it, it is under summary procedure? Merong dalawang option ang court. First is it can dismiss the case outright or it can issue summons. Basis is section 4. After the court determines that the case falls under summary procedure and after examining the allegations and the evidence attached, then it can dismiss the case outright on any of the grounds apparent for the dismissal of a civil action. If there is no ground for dismissal, then it can issue summons which shall state that the summary procedure under this, under this rule shall apply. After the service of summons, what is the next step? File an answer. But what if the client says, Attorney, I do not want you to file an answer. Instead, I want you to file a motion to dismiss the complaint. Is that allowed under the summary procedure? Answer is no. That is considered a prohibited motion under Section 19A. Motion to dismiss the complaint is not allowed except on two grounds. Ground number one is lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter. Second is failure to comply with the barangay conciliation. So take note ha. How about in your civil procedure under the 2019 amendments? Is your motion to dismiss the complaint also considered a prohibited pleading? Answer a prohibited motion rather, answer is yes. Very clear under Rule 15, Section 12 that your motion to dismiss is considered a prohibited motion. It is not allowed except on four grounds. Kung sa summary procedure, two grounds lang ang allowed in 2019 amendments, i-double mo yon naging apat. What are those grounds? First, Court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter. Second, there is another action pending between the same parties for the same cause. Third is litis pendentia. Fourth is res judicata. How about if the complaint is malabo, hindi mo na intindihan? Can you file a motion for bill of particulars? 
Answer is no. Because section 19B, very clear, that is very clear. Under the summary procedure, your motion for bill of particulars is a prohibited motion. How about in 2019 amendments that is considered a litigious motion, Rule 15, Section 5? Let us just say that hindi enough ang time para makapag-prepare ka ng answer. Kailangan mo pang mag-gather ng evidence. Kailangan mo pang kumuha ng mga affidavits ng inyong witnesses. Can you file a motion for extension to file an answer? In 2019 amendments, that is allowed one time. A motion for extension of time to file an answer is allowed. But the general rule is lahat ng motion for extension of time to file pleadings, to file affidavits, or any other papers that is considered a prohibited motion under Rule 15, Section 12, except yung motion for extension to file an answer. How about in summary procedure? Walang qualification. Lahat ng motion for extension of time that is a prohibited motion under Section 19A. Ipasok na natin. Motions for postponement. Can you file a motion for postponement in the civil procedure 2019 amendments? Answer is that is also considered a prohibited motion under Rule 15, Section 12F. But if your motion for postponement is based on the acts of God, forced majeure, physical inability of the witness to appear and testify, then that is allowed. How about in summary procedure? Dilatory motions for postponement is a prohibited motion very clear under Section 19, letter I. Balikan natin si motion to dismiss. We know now that both under the 2019 amendments and summary procedure, your motion to dismiss is a prohibited motion. That is a prohibited motion. Saan lang sila nagkakaiba? Under the 2019 amendments, you are allowed to file your motion to dismiss if it is based on four grounds. How about in summary procedure, you are allowed to file your motion to dismiss the complaint if it is based on two grounds. What are those two grounds? Number one is lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter and second is failure to comply with the barangay conciliation. Let's read section 18. Ano ang nakasulat dyan? Where there is no showing of compliance with the barangay complaint, uh, barangay conciliation, the case shall be dismissed. But what is the nature of the dismissal that is considered without prejudice? Take note ha, without prejudice. And it may be revived only after such requirement shall have been complied with. How about in 2019 amendments? Ano ang mangyayari kung walang compliance ng Barangay Conciliation? Can you raise that as a ground for your motion to dismiss? Answer is no. Hindi kasama yan sa apat na grounds na nabanggit. So, how will you consider that now in 2019 amendments? That is an affirmative defense. Very clear under Rule 8, Section 12, Number 5. Nakasulat dyan that a condition precedent for filing the claim has, if a condition precedent for filing the claim has not been complied with, then you can raise that as your affirmative defense in your answer. Take note, ha, that can be that is now considered as an affirmative defense, and you can raise that in your answer. And your failure to raise that as an affirmative defense at the earliest opportunity shall constitute a waiver thereof. What will happen if you're going to raise that? The court shall moto proprio resolve the affirmative defense within 30 calendar days from the filing of the answer. And if denied, if your affirmative defense of failure to comply with the condition precedent is denied, can you file a motion for reconsideration or Rule 65? Answer is no. Bakit? Ano ang sinasabi na ng 2019 amendments? You have to uh, wait for a decision. 
You have to wait for a judgment on the merits and then you are going to raise that among the matters on appeal. Take note, ha? It will be among the matters to be raised on appeal after a judgment on the merits. Let us just say that instead of filing those motions, itong si defendant finally decided to file an answer. Under the rules on summary procedure, the defendant has to file is his answer within 10 days. 10 days from when? 10 days from service of summons. How about if it is an ordinary procedure? The defendant has to file his answer within 30 calendar days. Take note ha, 30 calendar days after service of summons unless a different period is fixed by the court. If you have negative defenses or if you have affirmative defenses, then you have to plead it in your answer. Otherwise, it shall be deemed waived except for lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter. Is this also true in normal procedure or in an ordinary procedure? Answer is yes. Rule 9, Section 1, very clear. Defenses and objections not pleaded either in a motion to dismiss or in the answer are deemed waived. However, when it appears from the pleadings or the evidence on record that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter, there is another action pending between the same parties for the same cause or lettuce pendentia and res judicata, the court shall dismiss the claim. How about cross claims and compulsory counterclaims? If the cost claims and compulsory counterclaims are not asserted in the answer, then they shall be considered barred. However, if they are asserted in the answer, then the plaintiff has to answer them within 10 days from service of the answer. Take note, ha, the period is 10 days from service of the answer. Is this also true in your ordinary procedure? Answer is yes. Saan lang sila nagkakaiba? Nagkakaiba sila sa period. Because the period in answering that counterclaim or cross-claim is 20 calendar days from service. Let's go now to the pleadings allowed. Under the summary procedure, you are allowed to file your complaint. That is also true in the ordinary procedure. How about counterclaim? You are allowed also to file your compulsory counterclaim or your permissive counterclaim in ordinary procedure. But how about in summary procedure that is qualified? Bakit naging qualified? Because in summary procedure, you are only allowed to file your compulsory counterclaim. And that compulsory counterclaim must be pleaded in the answer. How about cross-claim? Cross-claim is also allowed in ordinary procedure. But in summary procedure, what is the requirement? Your cross-claim must be pleaded in the answer. Next, third or fourth party complaint. Are you allowed to do that or to file that in ordinary procedure? Answer is yes. How about in summary procedure? That is considered a prohibited pleading. That is a considered as a prohibited pleading. How about complaint in intervention that is also allowed under Rule 6, Section 2? But in summary procedure, interventions in general is considered a prohibited pleading. How about if you're going to file an answer, your answer where you are going to allege your defenses, then that is allowed. But in summary procedure, your answer is limited only to the complaint, to the counterclaim, or your answer to cross-claim. How about reply? Your reply under the 2019 amendments is now qualified. Bakit naging qualified? Because you are allowed to file, to file a reply only if the defending party attaches an actionable document to the answer. Then, 
if there is an actionable document to the answer, then you can file a reply in ordinary procedure. How about in summary procedure that is considered a prohibited pleading? What if the defendant opted not to file his answer? Merong nakapag-advise sa kanya. Ang sabi sa kanya, huwag mong pagpapansinin niyang kaso mo dyan sa MTC. Then, Section 6 has the answer. The effect of failure to file your answer. But take note first of Rule 9 kasi si Section 6 hindi mag apply if there are two or more defendants. If there are several defending parties, some of whom answer and the others fail to do so, the court, the court shall still try the case against all. The court shall still try the case against all upon the answers filed and the court shall render judgment upon the evidence presented. 1989 bar exam question distinguished between the effects of the failure to file an answer in a civil case governed by the summary rules and in a civil case governed by the regular provisions of the rules of court. In summary procedure, the applicable provision is Section 6, whereas in 2019 amendments, the applicable rule is Rule 9, Section 3. But saan talaga sila nagkakaiba? Himay-himay natin. In summary procedure, the court moto proprio or on motion of the plaintiff shall render judgment. The court moto proprio. Is this the same also in 2019 amendments? Answer is no. Bakit? Because in ordinary procedure, dapat si plaintiff Dapat si claiming party must first file a motion to declare defendant in default. And together with that motion is a notice to the defending party and proof of the, the proof of the failure of the defendant to file his answer within the time allowed. Is your motion to declare defendant in default allowed in summary procedure? Answer is no. That is considered a prohibited motion under Section 19, letter H. How about the judgment? Since hindi nakapag-file ng answer si defendant ng Hindi, since si defendant is hindi nakapag-file ng answer, automatic ba that the judgment will be favorable to the plaintiff? Answer is no. The judgment will be rendered as may be warranted. Take note ha, the word is may. Kaya hindi automatic na yung judgment or yung decision is favorable to the plaintiff. As may be warranted by the facts alleged in the complaint and if ever there would be judgment that is limited only to what is prayed for therein. And if there is an damages uh, claimed or attorney's fees claimed, then take note that can, the court can reduce the amount for being excessive or otherwise unconscionable. Parehas lang ba ito sa 2019 amendments? More or less, yes. The judgment also may be granted in favor of the plaintiff as his pleading may warrant unless unless the court in its discretion requires the claimant to submit evidence. Take note, however, that the court shall not render unliquidated damages. It shall not render a judgment that exceeds the amount that prayed for or it shall not render a judgment that is different in kind from that prayed for. After filing your answer, what is the next step? That is preliminary conference. Applicable rule is Section 7. Not later than 30 days after the last answer is filed, a preliminary conference shall be held. Take note that the rules on pre-trial in ordinary cases shall be applicable to the preliminary conference unless inconsistent with the provisions of this rule. Let's discuss preliminary conference. Take note that the equivalent of preliminary conference in ordinary procedure is pre-trial. So, kailan nagkakaroon ng preliminary conference or kailan siniset ang preliminary conference? It shall be not later than 30 days. 30 days from when? After the last answer is filed. How about pre-trial? Kailan siniset ang pre-trial? 
it shall not be later than 60 calendar days, 60 calendar days from when? From the filing of the last responsive pleading. Take note that under the 2019 amendments, hindi mo na kailangan mag-file ng motion to set the case for pre-trial. Trabaho na yan ngayon ng branch clerk of court. The branch clerk of court shall issue a notice of pre-trial. What if the plaintiff fails to appear in the, in the preliminary conference? What is the effect? The effect is it shall be a ground or it shall be a cause for the dismissal of his complaint. But dahil good boy itong si defendant, si, good, si defendant nag-appear, then defendant shall be entitled to judgment on his counterclaim. And all cross-claims shall be dismissed. But what if sa pre-trial ordinary procedure, si plaintiff fails to attend the, when duly notified under Rule 18, when duly notified the failure of the plaintiff and the counsel to appear without valid cost shall cause the dismissal of the action. So the same lang sila ng effect. But take note that in ordinary procedure, you that the nature of the dismissal is with prejudice. Take note ha, the dismissal shall be with prejudice unless otherwise ordered by the court. How about if it is the defendant, the defendant fails to appear in the preliminary conference, then what is the effect? The plaintiff shall be entitled to judgment. But, hindi yan applicable kung there are two or more defendants and isa doon sa mga two or more defendants ay nag-appear, then in that case, the plaintiff will not be entitled to judgment. How about in pre-trial, kung si defendant ay hindi nag-appear, then what will happen? It will allow the plaintiff to present his evidence ex parte and the court will render judgment on the basis of the evidence offered. After prelim preliminary conference, what is the next step? The court will issue an order or a record of preliminary conference that is very clear under Section 8. Within five days, five days after the termination of the preliminary conference, the court shall issue an order stating the matters, the matters taken up in the preliminary conference. Kayo na ang magbasa ng the rest ng Section 8 ha, because that is only a reading matter. Next step. There would be now a submission of affidavits and position papers. Very clear under Section 9, within 10 days from receipt of the order, the parties are required to submit the affidavits of their witnesses and to submit also the evidence on the factual issues defined in the order together with their position paper. And ano ang requirement sa position paper? It must set forth the law and the facts relied upon. After the submission of affidavits and position papers, then there will be a rendition of judgment. Take note that the rendition of judgment will happen within 30 days. 30 days from when? 30 days after receipt of the last affidavits and position papers or 30 days from the expiration of the period for filing that affidavit and position papers. Take note that there is this so-called clarificatory procedure. Kailan ba nagkakaroon ng clarificatory procedure? If the court finds it necessary to clarify certain material facts, then instead of rendering judgment, what it will do instead it is it will issue an order. In that order, it will specify the matters to be clarified and it will require the parties to submit affidavits or, avid or other evidence on the said matters within 10 days from receipt. And kailan ka nagkakaroon na ng judgment? Judgment shall be rendered within 15 days after the receipt of the last clarificatory affidavits or within 15 days from the expiration of the period to file said clarificatory affidavits. Take note that the court shall not resort to the clarificatory procedure
in order to gain time for the rendition of the judgment. That is very clear under section 10. If the judgment or the decision is not favorable to you, what is your remedy? You file an appeal. The judgment or final order shall be appealable to the appropriate RTC, which shall decide the case on the basis of the entire records of the proceedings and such memoranda or briefs submitted by the parties or required by the regional trial courts. Take note that the decision of the regional trial courts in civil cases governed by the rule on summary procedure including forcible entry and unlawful detainer shall be immediately executory, immediately executory without prejudice to a further appeal that may be taken therefrom. That is very clear according to your section 21. Take note also that when the case is already in the RTC, yung rule ng summary procedure no longer applies. The rule on summary procedure applies only in cases filed before the MTC. And if the decision of the RTC is still not favorable to you, what will you do? Then you go to the Court of Appeals via petition for review under Rule 42. Let us just say that itong si party ayaw mag-file ng appeal. Instead, the party wants to file a motion for new trial or a motion for reconsideration of a judgment or a motion for opening of trial. Are you allowed to do that? Answer is no, because that is considered a prohibited uh, motion under Section 19, Letter C. How about a petition for relief from judgment? Can you file that one? Answer is also no. That is considered a prohibited pleading under Section 19, Letter F. How about if you're going to file a Rule 65? Pwede ka bang mag-file ng Rule 65? Answer is no. Basic concept ng Rule 65 is there must be no appeal. And since under Section 21 of the Rule on Summary Procedure, your remedy is appeal, therefore you exclude Rule 65. But we are talking about a final order. What if you are going to file a Rule 65 for your interlocutory order? Are you allowed to do that? Answer is also no, because that is considered a prohibited pleading. A petition for certiorari, mandamus, or prohibition against any interlocutory order issued by the court is a prohibited pleading under Section 19, Letter G. Balikan natin si motion for reconsideration of a judgment. Take note that the judgment sought to be reconsidered is one that is rendered on the merits. That is a judgment rendered by the court after trial on the merits of the case. There was this case decided by the Supreme Court kung saan nagkaroon ng order of dismissal issued by the MTC judge. Bakit? Because the party failed to appear during the preliminary conference. And ano ang ginawa ng party? Nag-file siya ng motion for reconsideration. Ano ang sabi natin? Your motion for reconsideration is a prohibited pleading. But ano ang sabi ng Supreme Court? That motion for reconsideration of the order of dismissal is not the prohibited pleading contemplated under Section 19 of the Rule on Summary Procedure. Bakit? Because the motion for reconsideration must be of a judgment, a judgment that is rendered by the court after trial on the merits of the case. 1991, bar exam question, twinist ko konti dito yung facts para pasok sa ating discussion. So for failure of the tenant X to pay rentals, A, the court appointed administrator of the estate of Henry Datu decides to file an action against X for the recovery of possession of the list premises located in Davao City and for the payment of the accrued rentals in the amount of 125,000 pesos. Question, what is the court of proper jurisdiction and venue of the intended action? Answer is MTC and the rule that will govern is the rule on summary procedure. Sabi nga natin, lahat ng kaso ng forcible entry and unlawful detainer irrespective of the amount of unpaid rentals sought to be recovered 
is under the rule on summary procedure under MTC. And what is the venue? The venue is where the property is located, where the real property is located. Question number two, supposing that referral is necessary but the complaint is filed without such referral, may it be dismissed? Answer is yes. You can file a motion to dismiss and your ground is failure to comply with the barangay conciliation. Ano ang sabi natin in section 18 when there is no showing of compliance with the barangay conciliation then the case shall be dismissed but the nature of the dismissal is without prejudice and it can only be revived only after the requirement shall have been complied with. 1989 bar exam question, Dalmasio, he filed a case, a civil case against Cagio for the collection of 95,000 in the MTC of Bacoor. Stop muna tayo. So ano ang rule na maggagovern in this problem? That is the rule on summary procedure. Sabi nga natin, if the total amount of the claim of the claim of the plaintiff does not exceed 100,000 pesos outside of Metropolitan Manila, exclusive of interest and cost, then the revised rule on summary procedure applies. After an examination of the complaint, the judge dismissed the case outright due to improper venue. Can the judge do that? Answer is yes. What did we say again? Ano ang procedure? Upon the filing of the verified complaint with the MTC, the court will determine if the case falls under summary procedure. And if the case falls under the summary procedure, the court has two options whether to issue summons or to dismiss the case outright. Ang ginawa, sa ating, ang ginawa ni judge sa ating problem is dismiss niya yung case outright. Delmasio filed a motion for reconsideration of the order of dismissal, contending that the provision in the promissory note attached to the complaint and made as the basis thereof clearly shows that the case must be filed with the, with the Bacoor court. Although realizing and admitting that he committed an error in dismissing the case, the judge said that he could not revoke his previous order because no action can be taken on the motion for reconsideration which is a prohibited pleading under the summary rules. Question, is the judge correct? Answer is no. The judge is not correct. Sabi nga ng Supreme Court, a motion for the reconsideration of such order of dismissal is not the prohibited pleading contemplated under Section 19 of the revised rule on summary procedure. Bakit? Dapat yung motion for reconsideration must be of a judgment, a judgment rendered by the court after trial on the merits of the case. Another bar exam question, Juan, he appeals the decision against him to the RTC which affirmed in total the lower court's decision. Juan then filed a motion for reconsideration. Maria moves to strike out the motion for reconsideration as, is, as it is a prohibited pleading under the rules on summary procedure. Question, is this tenable? Answer is no, because the rule on prohibited pleadings in summary procedure is applicable only to the MTC. Ano nga ang sabi natin? After the rendition of judgment, your next move is to file an appeal, file an appeal to the appropriate RTC. But take note that when the case is already in the RTC, the rule on summary procedure no longer applies. The rule on summary procedure applies only in cases filed before the MTCs. 1996 bar exam question A. He brought an action for unlawful detainer against B and the MTC. B filed a motion to dismiss on the ground of lack of cause of action for failure to first refer the dispute to the Barangay Lopon. Acting on the motion of B, the case was dismissed. A therefore filed a petition for certiorari with the RTC assailing that dismissal order of the MTC on the ground that the motion to dismiss filed by B is a prohibited motion under the revised rules on summary procedure. Question letter A, is the contention of A correct? Answer is definitely no. Because ano ang sabi natin? 
Well, the motion to dismiss is considered as a prohibited pleading, but since the ground is failure to comply with the barangay consolidation, then that motion to dismiss is therefore allowed. That is allowed under Section 19, Letter A. Question Letter B. Is certiorari the proper remedy? Definitely, the answer is no. Ano ang sabi natin? Whether it is an interlocutory order or a final order, certiorari is always not the proper remedy. If it is an interlocutory order, that is considered a prohibited pleading. Rule 65 is a prohibited pleading under Section 19, Letter G. How about if it is a final order? Then your certiorari is not the proper remedy because the proper remedy is appeal. That is very clear under Section 21. If there is a judgment or final order, it shall be appealable to the appropriate RTC. But since the ground here is about the barangay conciliation, ano ang mangyayari under Section 18? When there is no, where there is no showing of compliance with the barangay conciliation, the case shall be dismissed without prejudice. Pwede mong i-refile, pwede mong i-revive only after the requirement shall have been complied with.